I really didn't think I was as sick as I was. I thought I could live with that. It's slow, and so yes, you stay in denial. Nancy and I met through working in radiology. We're both radiologists. I used to be in charge of scheduling, but I used to schedule her with me all the time so that we could work together. I've always enjoyed exercise. I ski, I cross-country ski, I snowshoe. I love to ride my bike. Part of our job as general radiologists is reviewing chest images, which includes chest x-rays and chest CT scans. I've been competing in endurance sports for over 15 years now, and most recently I've been competing in mountain running. I study exercise because I believe so strongly in the value of exercise and you should study what you care about. I'm a clinical exercise physiologist and my research program studies breathlessness and exercise intolerance in patients with chronic lung conditions. I knew I had lung problems for quite a while. I was misdiagnosed many times. I developed a cough with a cold and the cough just never went away. You start having problems with hills, having problems with steps, problems with really any type of exertion. Nancy said uh, we should go into hospital and get a chest x-ray. We both looked at it. We, we were totally shocked and totally devastated. It looked like a terminal lung condition. And ultimately, I would need a lung transplant. Interstitial lung disease is really an umbrella term that encompasses well over 150 different diseases characterized by scarring of the lungs and inflammation. The most common interstitial lung disease is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and the average survival is around two to three years from the time of diagnosis. I said, Don, your lung condition is going to continue to get worse and worse and we have to make you more and more fit and that was the first day of our walking together. I wasn't exercising as soon as I tried to. I remember trying to run one time and I took about 10 steps and started coughing. One of the biggest challenges individuals with interstitial lung disease face is this very distressing symptom of breathlessness. You can't get a big breath. It feels like you've got something wrapped around you. You become able to do less and less you're trying to get your breath and you're coughing so hard. It's very scary. To me, it seemed logical that breathing high levels of oxygen should reduce symptoms of breathlessness. But when I looked through the scientific literature, I couldn't really find any evidence to support that. And so we wanted to carry out a study to look at the role of high levels of oxygen to reduce breathing discomfort during exercise. Funding from the BC Lung Association helped support equipment for my lab and also the salary support for a promising PhD student to carry out this study as part of her doctoral thesis. When I first started this research, I found the prognosis to be really striking. You have these symptoms and there's not much they can do to bring them down. So from the research perspective, I found that there was a really great need. I was deteriorating physically because I wasn't able to do things. One of my first patients that came into the lab was Barbara, and uh, I was pretty green in research, and this was a big deal for me. It was my first clinical exercise study. I had wires everywhere. I had headgear on. They were measuring my breath. We put her through a full battery of breathing tests. We got her on the bike and made her exercise for as long and as hard as she could. The speed they asked of me was pretty fast, and after seven minutes, I couldn't do it. I had to stop. When she came in again and we gave her this supplemental oxygen, she actually lasted for 43 minutes. All of us were pretty shocked by this. We were looking around at each other. We had to draw more lines in into our data collection forms. I was checking the bike to see if the resistance somehow let up because it was such a profound improvement. With the help of oxygen, I was able to do so much more. We were trying on our own to do our walks and things, but when he was enrolled in the study and we were able to go to St. Paul's Hospital and be supervised by all these experts, it was just a wonderful gift for us. They knew how to push you a certain amount to try and get you improving. 
I could practically see the improvements after each of the sessions. Fitness is extremely important for individuals wanting lung transplant. We know from research that higher levels of fitness will increase your chance of surviving following a transplant. Under the supervision of my respirologist, I got oxygen at home. So I was able to use the treadmill at home and I made a point of being on it for 45 minutes a day. I would take an oxygen tank in my backpack and we limited our walks based on how long the oxygen tank would last. Don's condition was progressive. He would have these kind of stepwise progressions downwards. When you hear about a prognosis of two to three years, and you have a study that you're planning to do for three to four, the idea that these individuals aren't going to be around to potentially see this research through, um, I found that, to be honest, pretty upsetting. I got a lot worse, and uh, I knew once I got worse, I wasn't going to be getting better. At the end, you are just on a continual diet. I really needed the transplant. So I was very grateful for the call. It's scary, but at that point, you don't have a choice. This was my last hope. More people die of pulmonary fibrosis each year than women die of breast cancer, and yet it's drastically underfunded. My recovery, I think, in part thanks to the study I was in, it went really quite well. The fitter you are going into surgery, you recover so much faster. I was in and out of hospital in two weeks. We tested 20 patients with interstitial lung disease for this study, and the magnitude of improvement we saw was unlike anything we've seen in the literature. We were able to take those results and secure over $2.1 million to take this intervention across the country. We recently launched a multi-center national clinical trial at eight different sites across Canada, and the premise of that clinical trial was the preliminary results of my doctoral research. Oftentimes you hear of these exciting things going on in the lab, and then those exciting ideas never leave the lab. And something unique about the studies that we're doing, I see them already translating outside of the lab. The fact that I'm able to actually impact the life of another individual, I think, is huge. While in the hospital after my surgery, I had two goals. Two, to get on the top of Whistler Mountain again, and I wanted to bring my grandchildren, and to go back to France and ride my bicycle. And I've done both. I would just like to thank everyone who has donated to this study. We really appreciate how wonderful something is that a lot of people might take for granted. Nancy and I still walk in the woods every day. <laughs>